This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian. I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. Look, some of us are lazy, all right? If by lazy you mean wrong. Prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide whether the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers. Because guess what? This film is lit. Outdated institutions robotic replacements, and a neighborhood where everything seems just a little bit off. It's The Stepford Wives, and this film is lit. Hello and welcome back to the 23rd episode of This Film is Lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books, compare and contrast the adaptations, and then pick... An ultimate winner of whether the book or the film is better. I have a feeling this one's going to be pretty easy. In case you haven't seen The Stepford Wives or read it, Katie, you have the book synopsis or the movie synopsis? I have the book synopsis. All right. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. These are different enough. Probably we'll do the thing where where Katie does the synopsis of the book. I'm going to leave... And I'm going to synopsisize the movie. I didn't write that down, but I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll wing it. <laughs> so, here we go. All right, so here's our book synopsis. Joanna Eberhardt, her husband Walter, and their two children move to Stepford to get out of the city. Modern, independent Joanna is frustrated by the culture of Stepford, with women who only seem interested in keeping house, and men who spend all their time smoking cigars in the No Girls Allowed Men's Association. She does eventually meet two women who seem pretty normal. Um, One of them suspects that there may be something in Stepford's water supply that turns women into submissive, docile housewives. Uh, At first, Joanna thinks the theory is a little bit silly, until both of her new friends somehow turn into Stepford Wives overnight. So, feeling like the clock is counting down on her own transformation, Joanna does her her research and forms her own theory. The men of Stepford are murdering their wives and replacing them with robots. Of course, anyone that she tries to tell about this theory um, reacts... Well, probably the way that any of us would, um, if we were told that. Um, And Joanna ends up, at the end of the book, she ends up uh, cornered by the men of the neighborhood. There's a kind of a fade to black moment, and the next time we see Joanna is through another character's eyes, and she is looking and acting just a little too perfect. Why are we moving? We're moving so that we can be the happiest family in the whole world. Welcome to Stepford. Stepford is the family paradise. It has no crime, no poverty, and no pushing. Good morning, ladies. Wait, you work out dressed like this? Of course. We always want to look our very best. So, Stepford Wives, the 2004 film starring Nicole Kidman, Matthew Broderick, Glenn Close, and Bette Midler, among other people. And Christopher Walken. Joelle, I don't remember her last name, Nicole Kidman's character, uh, is a high-powered TV executive uh, who does, like, makes really ridiculous, uh, produces really ridiculous, like, reality TV. Uh, One of the people who was the, (laughs) on her, one of her TV shows, where spouses got to fuck whoever they wanted, and then decide whether or not they wanted to stay with their spouse the guy spouse left him and now he's really mad and he comes and tries to kill her and then it turns out he also shot his ex-wife and her boyfriend's 
And so Nicole Kidman is fired from her job as a TV executive because her shows are too much of a liability. So then she has a mental breakdown and uh, it gets electroshock treatment. And then is uh, uh, Matthew Broderick decides to also leave his job at because he also worked for the TV, TV network. He leaves his job so that they can move to Connecticut and restart their lives in a simpler uh, town without jobs now. I don't understand that part. but uh, And so they get to Stepford, Connecticut, again, to kind of give her a fresh start, I guess, somewhere new. And then uh, they start realizing that the neighborhood seems strange. Uh, and Matthew Broderick is realized, introduced to the fact that, oh the men in the neighborhood have some sort of technology or thing that they do to change their wives into submissive, uh, controllable, remote controllable, basically sex robots servants. And then he decides to do it to Nicole Kidman. But then he doesn't. The end. (laughs) And then there's some other stuff, but there's we'll get into other it. other stuff. Oh my god, that movie. <laughs> the movie was something else. It was, it was straight nonsense. It was straight nonsense. We'll get into it. Let's go to our first segment, though. Guess who? Who are you? No one of consequence. I must know. Get used to disappointment. Okay. So I have two that I think are still viable. Okay. 60 if she was a day, but working at youth and vivacity. Ginger hair, red lips, a sunshine yellow dress. Her brown leather shoulder bag was enormous, old, and scuffed. Read the first part again. I was confused by that. 60 if she was a day, but working at youth and vivacity. Ginger hair, red lips, a sunshine yellow dress. I don't know the character's name, but I'm going to go with uh, the Glenn Close's character. Yeah. Uh, Mike's, w- I don't know her name. Mike's wife. Um, in the book, I'm, I'm counting this as the same character because she serves a similar purpose at the beginning of the story. Okay. She's the welcome wagon lady. Okay. And the reason I chose her was because the yellow dress, they wear yellow Mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. That her and Mike do for some, I don't know if that's a thing they decided to, with that character. Well, that's, boy, the fact that you said she serves a similar purpose in the beginning makes me think the (laughs) ending of this movie is very different. (laughs) But we'll get to that. Okay, so here's our second one. She was short and heavy bottomed in a blue Snoopy sweatshirt and jeans and sandals. Her mouth was big with unusually white teeth, and she had blue take-in-everything eyes and short, dark, tufty hair and small hands and dirty toes. Mm, Okay. Uh, My guess would be uh, Bette Midler's character. Yeah, you're right on that one, too. Cool. So you were two for two. Two for two. (sighs) So that was pretty easy, honestly. (laughs) I had, like, eight or nine. Oh! None of those characters were named in the movie sweet like they're probably some, some of, of them, them i were think yeah um well when they were showing then like the names of the wives when she was looking them yeah. up on the internet um a lot of them were like like i recognized the names but they didn't like combine them correctly hmm. or like they were like weird mashups of the different names that i recognized from the story and i'm like why would you bother <laughs> yeah i guess for book readers to just be like oh wait what yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> I don't... cool well, crushed it on Guess Who. Let's move on to the boy. This is going to be interesting. Was that in the book? Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. The what? Honestly, don't you two read? The answer is probably no. Uh, yeah, it's kind of the vibe I was getting. I have quite a few here. We'll start at the top, because my first thought, this book was written in 1970. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously TV existed, but... Reality TV didn't exist. I mean, right. there were game shows, so I guess. But so uh, Nicole Kidman's character, Joelle, right? Is her Joanna. Name? Joanna. 
was she a TV executive? No. Okay. She's just a regular lady. Just a regular lady. And she is um, a semi-professional photographer. She works in media, kind of. Kind of. Does she? Okay. She takes, like, kind of artsy photographs and tries to sell them to, like, magazines and stuff. Gotcha. I don't even know where I want to get into it, if it's here or later. So, (laughs) this is so hard, because I don't... (sighs) The whole reason they move to Stepford, is that from the book that she gets fired and has a nervous breakdown, and so they go to restart their life. No. They're just moving out of the city and into the suburbs right? because that's a thing that you do when you have kids. That makes so much more sense. The whole conceit at the beginning of this was so strange to me. And I I, I think I understood what they were going for. They're like, well, it makes her character more interesting, or it makes it more interesting if she's like a super career woman. And then somehow that. But it's it just so, doesn't make sense. It's, it, it was so embarrassingly on the nose. Yeah. Like, I felt embarrassed for the writers of this movie. Yeah. To me, the thing that would make more sense is if she was, if they moved here while she still had a job, mm-hmm. and then there was a clash between sort of the traditional the Stepford Wives and her having a, like, being yeah. a career woman that's more interesting, but the way that she like lost her job and now she's just kind of there. Well, get I I don't even know. I I <laughs> they're like they're, there's no jobs. They don't have jobs. They don't do yeah, anything. Yeah, and they're they just living moved. in a McMansion. They just moved. That was in my. I have that in a later segment. But yeah, they just moved to a mansion, and and they're not working. They're not doing anything. I mean, sure, they may have saved some money, but they didn't save that much money. They worked at a TV network, right? To go and live in a mansion in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. In a gated community. No, absolutely. Like that. The no. There's no way they had that much money saved, and and but even still, it's like so. You're neither of you are just gonna work anymore. You're both like forty. Like what? <laughs> what is going on? Like it just the the initial conceit of them moving there made no sense, and I was like, I don't understand why. What's go- why we're going here? Why you why there? Would you yeah. move there? I, mm, I I don't know. In the book, it's just like oh, this is a nice neighborhood. Right. See, that just makes more sense. It's more natural. Like it yeah. just it makes sense, and it, it's creepier. Too, yeah, because then it's like it's just like a neighbor like it's in, in this with it being like this weird like she had a mental breakdown and like it's this big event and it cat can you stop that's our cat trying to get into a cabinet all right so she doesn't work in tv and she doesn't have a mental breakdown and this guy doesn't try to kill her no <laughs> for, none of that happens none of that happens okay cool the square dancing is there a square dancing scene no that scene so there's a square dancing scene and kind of early when they first get to Stepford where they go to a picnic and then everybody square dances. And that's fine. I get it. I didn't mind the idea of like the town picnic because right. that's like a super yeah. suburbia yeah. kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's sort of very uh, idyllic. Yeah. Harkening back to uh, a, yes, simpler a simpler time. time. And the same thing with the square dancing. But the square dancing scene in this movie just lasts forever and nothing happens in it until the lady malfunctions or whatever. Yeah. But like, I'm sitting there like, what? There's not even like, they're just dancing and we're watching it for like five minutes. And I'm like, what? And these awful screechy violins. Yeah. yeah. And, but, and they never even, I was like watching, I'm like, did they think people were going to be entertained by this? Like, there's not even interesting dancing. Ha- there's nothing. Ha- there's just mm-hmm. watching our main characters kind of dance for a few minutes. And I'm like, what is, what is this? Why are we watching this? Is there, a, is there a moment earlier in the film or early in the film, like in the moment of the square dancing where the, uh, somebody's wife malfunctions and this is their first or Nicole Kimmon's first like no warning that something's weird the book is way more subtle way more subtle yeah. I don't I find that unsurprising because this movie could not be less subtle it, it is about as subtle as like a baseball bat with a bullhorn attached to it yeah I don't even know how to talk about it. There's so many things that I don't. <laughs> and next thing, is there a gay couple? No, there's not. I would figure not based, I mean, because it was written in 1970. It wasn't as 
common for something like that. So is there an equivalent to that? Like another friend that or whatever? Um, there is a black couple oh, okay. near the end of the story. Which, I mean, it was just 1971-72. Yeah. So the idea that they're moving to a place like Stepford was kind of the progressive thing right. in the book, I guess. Right. So in the movie, there's a one of the other couples who they run into at the picnic, which, again, this is all very weird to me. They, they run into them at the picnic, and they she runs in, uh, Nicole Kidman's character runs into Bette Midler, uh, who's a writer named Bobby, who she knows. Yeah, she like knows her because she's a famous writer. Yeah. No, they like I felt like they knew each other. Oh, I not. thought she just like recognized her. Yeah, name. fair enough, probably. And then another guy, a, a, a gay couple, but the main guy from the couple that we get to know, I can't remember his name, but Jerry, Roger, Roger, Roger. They he gets turned eventually. But anyway, so there, there's a gay couple. I was wondering, I was like, oh, is that gonna be a gay couple in the 1970s one? Probably not. Yeah, added that for the 2004 remake. I thought it was very strange that. Because they, when she runs into them at the picnic and they're like instantly all friends and she like knew them, I was like, wait, who are these people? Why are they? Yeah. Like, well, especially with Bobby. Like, the t- the pacing in this movie is so weird. Oh, it's terrible. And like, I don't, like, because then in the next scene, they're all like BFFs. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know and how I don't long know, it's Yeah, been. I don't know how much time was supposed to have passed. That's why I thought they knew each other before they got there, because it. They all were, like, immediately, like, best friends, like, hanging out. And because he, he says something about, like, oh, how... Because there's a moment where they talk about how Roger and his his husband have been in couples counseling for a year. And, and the way they talk about it is, like, something they... That these people knew about their relationship. And it's so fucking yeah. weird. I didn't understand what... Again, this movie was rewritten and reshot, like, a million times. So I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. And that there's, like... It, the movie can't decide... Like, there's scenes here that's, like, slapped around here and there, and it can't decide wh- wh- whether it's coming or going, but... Well, and I don't know. I Like I said, like, the pacing was super weird no. nonsense. Like the, and it's only a 90-minute film, so yeah. they cram a lot. Like, try the to... square dancing where they're having the neighborhood party, that was, like, a 4th of July thing, I yeah. think they said. Yeah. And then there's another scene, like, a couple scenes later... Yeah, like, two scenes later. ...where they're talking about Christmas decorations. Yeah, and they're, like, singing Christmas songs, but I thought that But might... it's still, like... Like, the summer. weather looks like summer, and I'm like, it's Connecticut. My thought was that, yeah, if it was winter, that would be fucking winter. Like, yeah. It would, yeah. My thought was that they were, like, practicing for, like, in the summer, like, getting ready already. Like, uh, yeah, that's part I of guess, the... I mean, yeah. that would be a Stepford wifey thing Yeah, to do. that's my only guess, but yeah, it was very strange. I was like, and they never ex- said, like, you know, there's never any sort of allusion to how long, other yeah. than the very end of the movie when it says six months later, but, like... I, for all we know, this entire movie takes place over three days. Yeah. I have it really no idea. Could. It really could take place over like a week or like six months. Like I don't, or yeah. like, a, I, yeah, no idea. Okay, when they first get there, they move into their big fancy mansion house and they meet their new dog and they have a robot dog. Is there a robot dog in the There's book? There's not a robot dog. Cool. We'll talk more about the robot dog later. Yeah, I want to talk about the robot dog later. Because there's a couple things with it, or mainly one thing with it that I thought was very strange. Okay, but there is a robot dog. In the movie, it is very CGI robot dog. Oh, it is the most CGI robot dog. super CGI robot dog. And I thought it was very strange because Frank Oz directed this and sort of classically works with a lot of puppets and animatronics and stuff. You could have made a little animatronic dog. dog. It's in like two scenes and all it does is fall down the stairs once. Like, it doesn't do anything that yeah. you need it to be CG. No. You could take a shitty, like, r- animatronic dog, have it move its head and stuff, and then have a stand-in one that you can toss down the stairs for that scene. And then the only other scene is one where, like, a ball comes out of its mouth. Yeah. I... And and you could do that with an animatronic. Like, and I was like, why are we doing this weird <laughs> CG dog? So then, uh, and we'll jump forward in my was that in the book, but I thought this was so silly. At the end of the movie, towards the end of the movie, uh, once... <laughs> Nicole Kidman has figured it out to some extent of what's going on, kind of. But so she goes to confront them. Or I don't even remember what happens. She ends up at the club, the clubhouse. She, she goes to get her kids. She goes to get her kids, right? She goes to get her kids, and they say the kids are at the clubhouse or whatever. And so she goes in there, and because the, the men have like a like a clubhouse that they all hang out in, yeah. Um, and she goes there. And they all, like, are there wearing their dumb red coats. And this is when th- they're going to uh, upgrade her or whatever, or turn her into a robot. Because uh, cause 
Matthew Brett and Broderick, of course, has agreed to it. And they, they, in order to explain to us, the viewer, and the, the characters at the same time, they just play an educational video oh at us. And he explains through the educational video. I'm like, why do they have that video? Who is that for? <laughs> but so he plays an educational video where he's like, yeah, we just put some robo chips in the brain. And then doop doop, put them in a machine. And then all of a sudden, they're perfect spouse. Does that, how, is that at all like what happens? How they explain to the, our characters what's going on in the book? Well, you remember I said the book was subtle. You're never really explicitly told that her suspicions about the women being turned into robots are correct. By the oh. end of the book, I mean, you you know. Right. You know what's happened. Yeah. But we're never told what's happened. Oh. That makes sense. Because I thought it was dumb when they told us in yeah. the in the movie, or at least how they told us, with it just being fucking, uh, yeah, a video that they played. And we're like, here's what's going on, dummies. Oh, and the whole last half hour was just, it was like, okay, movie, I'm not an idiot. Like, you're just explaining things at yeah. me. Yeah, they really, these people have big conversa- big, like, I say conversations, the characters just monologue yeah. about what's going on. Like, the end part where uh, Bette Midler, not Bette Midler, uh, Glenn Close's character literally just stands in front of everybody. Yeah. And just says her motivations at them. Well, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what is happening? I love my favorite part. She has a line at the end. Glenn Close is like, I was the best scientist in the world. I was a genetic engineer and a, and like the way she says it and like announces it to the crowd is so strange. And I'm just like, what is happening? Okay. This was so confusing to me. All right. Finally, when she gets to the clubhouse and it's because she's trying to find her kids to leave. And then they talk to her and they're like, you're gonna, we can make you the perfect spouse or whatever. And then, she looks at Matthew Broderick and is like, "You're not gonna do this, right?" And he, he's like, "Yeah, I am, basically." Yeah. And then he t- and then they bring up a pedestal with her robot body on it, which we'll talk about. Holy shit, will we talk about this? Because this makes no sense, yeah. and and not only makes no sense, I think the movie kept forgetting what it said it was doing. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, like I think the movie had like could literally had to have forgot the people making this movie forgot. Yeah. What they said earlier in the movie versus yeah. what they and what happens later in the movie versus some of the things we see with the uh, we'll talk about it here in a second. Um, let's put a pin in that. But so th- they bring up like her weird like robot body thing, and 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 then he like Matthew Broderick steps on the platform, and then uh, Christopher Walken, who's like the head of the thing, his name's Mike, mm-hmm. and he's like the guy in charge of all this. He like motions to her and is like, "Come on, get on." And she just does. She just gets on it. Yeah. And looks at Matthew Broderick and then, like, kind of cries. And then it goes down into the floor. And then the next we see her, she's now a robot person. I mean, without getting into it. So w- she just agrees to become the robot. I, I thing. don't know if we're supposed to think that she just agreed to it or if we're supposed to think that maybe they somehow, like, were able to silently communicate with each other. There's that no I implication don't... that 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 Matthew Broderick somehow uh, communicated to her that he wasn't going to. Also, it makes no sense that he he's not the person who turns them into robots. Matthew Broderick's not the person to do it because later. So spoilers. I, we're just getting into it. Spoilers. <laughs> She eventually, we think she gets turned into a robot or whatever, into a Stepford wife. Turns out she wasn't. She was acting the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and that Matthew Broderick didn't go through with it. But here's the thing. Ma- why would Matthew Broderick be the one to do? It's not. They have to do. The rest of it. Yeah. Like, whoever's the smart tech people like, or the people. They know how to do it. So yeah. So they would have to be the ones to do to it. To do it to her. 
Which, and, and Unless now, it's an automated process. Well, if it worked like they showed in the instructional yeah, video. Where they put them in like a chamber. Which was basically they put her in like an oven. Yeah. And like, or whatever. Yeah. Boy, there are a lot of implications there. Yeah. And then she just like comes out as a Stepford wife. Right. Sure, maybe Matthew Broderick could do that. Yeah, I guess but if that's the But then when we ambl- actually go down and see the underground lab no, thing, it's, it's like, like super it's lab equipment. Yeah, they're like computers and you have to, and <laughs> they have like scans of their whole yeah. physiology and stuff and they like clearly like implant things in their br- I don't, it makes I, no sense that they would be confused. And so my biggest thing, and here I think what they were going for, because the one thing I wanted to know if it was in the book is if they have this weird moment where she just agrees for no reason to be converted into a Stepford wife because I was like, what? Why is she not just trying to run away or anything or any, like she just is all of a sudden like goes from like, this is crazy to like, all right, fine. And I'm like, what? Yeah, Why? Um, so does that happen? No. Okay. So she doesn't get, does she even get turned into a Stepford wife in the, that's the implication. Yeah. That's kind of what I figured. And that's kind of where I thought the movie yeah. was. I, I have a, we'll get, Oh my God. I have so much to talk about this. <laughs> I think that is what the movie originally did, and I think that people didn't like it, and so they did the whole ending that we saw was all different. I have a feeling. I would have to agree with that, because if if we wanted it to be an even slightly more faithful adaptation, it ends right after that scene in the grocery yes, store. Yes, 100%. That's what I thought. I think that's what it did end. Okay, so she in the, in the, in the movie, she gets... And this is... We're, we're segment, the segments are fucking out the window, kind of. I mean, we'll get into more of them. But So uh, in, the, in the movie, she, she agrees to be changed into a Stepford wife f- for some reason. Yeah. And then she goes down in the floor, and then it cuts to the grocery store, and then we see her walk out as a Stepford wife and I'm, and we're like oh shit and to me I was like that's how the movie ended mm-hmm. originally that was mm-hmm. the ending and it makes sense because that it, that's a very um, it's very like a Twilight Zone ending it's a very good like horror movie ending like kind yeah. of depressing but like <sighs> poignant ending yeah versus what the movie decides to do but I have a feeling that was how it ended and then they people didn't like it. They were like, "Oh God, that's how it ends." She just becomes a Stepford wife, and then well, it, right, because the rest of the movie doesn't fucking play like a horror movie. No, the rest of the movie, it I plays don't even know like what a it, silly. What the, yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know what the rest of the movie is. But then, so there's another ten minutes after that. But I think that all of that was different. I think all of that was added. Maybe oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't know because it's it's so wonky and and bonkers where it goes after that. But I thought I bet it ended with her just becoming a separate wife, and then things just went on like normal. Because oh, that's where the book that's ends. The book ends. Yeah. Okay, that's and that's what I, I had a feeling that was how the book ended. Yeah, because that makes sense, and that's a kind of a classic sort of nihilistic sci-fi, not nihilistic, but um, yeah, that dark. Yeah, and the, and the book is a lot like like an ending. episode of Twilight, Twilight Zone. Zone. Yeah, which is what. This movie should have been, yeah. But instead, it was couldn't figure out if it wanted to be a comedy Mm-mm. or or because it's definitely not a horror movie, Mm-mm. even a little bit. No, it's definitely like a. I think it's not it even was, a thriller. I think, I think they it was were going for to be satire. Yeah, but it doesn't. It's yeah, but it's not good satire. No. So, anyways, to get back to my point originally, where she decides to become a Stepford wife or whatever, I think what they were doing there was that was supposed to be sort of a symbolic moment of unless there is the implication that she knew Matthew brought and they had somehow communicated that they weren't going to turn her into it, but whatever my thought was that they thought it might be interesting to have a moment where she submits to that mm-hmm. where where her character is faced with the choice of conforming to the traditional gender like roles or or staying as the strong independent woman who don't need no man that she is and i think they might have thought that was interesting to put that choice in front of the character but then again her so the then they they pull the rug out though because i thought it could be interesting if they did that and then she just gets turned into a stepford wife it's it's not good but it is there's an interesting thing there but then they pull it back out by going nope i was faking it the whole time i never actually she didn't even make it none of it makes sense so so then if she so she got, <laughs> she didn't get turned into a Stepford wife, but she went down in the floor thing or whatever, and then started acting like one, and then they hatched a plan to save everybody, I, I guess. Yes. 
I'm so exhausted by trying to figure out this movie. I don't know. I feel like this script was written by, like, five different people who never spoke to each other. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then, and then reform. And it was. It was written by a bunch of uh, studio people because the audiences didn't like it, so they kept rechanging yeah. things. And apparently the ending was completely different. Remember, I did say that the original ending was closer to the book, which is one of the reasons I yeah. think that the scene where she walks out in the grocery store and is basically just a Stepford Wife, I think is probably how the movie ended initially. And then they were like, uh, the audiences were like, oh, that's dark. We don't like it. I don't know. That's all I can think. And which would make sense and to some extent with how the tone of the rest of the movie of this weird, wacky, like kind of a comedy, kind of not like it's not really anything, which is part of the problem. Yeah. It's not dark enough and interesting enough to be like good satire. And it's I mean, it has some moments of 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 good dialogue and good lines. Yeah. To some extent, kind of poking fun at traditional gender roles and, and that sort of thing. But at the same time. When they made Nicole Kidman her character, it kind of ruins the whole thing because her, or the whole point of her, uh, of this sort of assessment of traditional female gender roles, staying at home, wife, uh, submissive, subservient, whatever, mm-hmm. versus a queer woman who's self possessed and that sort of thing. By making her, they make Nicole Kidman's character like crazy in the beginning. Yeah. Like, she's making legitimately terrible, like, ridiculous reality TV shows that are yeah. ridic- legitimately ruining people's lives. And I get that it was 2004. Right, so they were spoofing kind of on a, the, the reality on, show yeah. satire. So they, But they shouldn't have done that. No. They, shouldn't have, they, they didn't need to critique reality TV in their critique of gender roles because it ruins their critique of gender roles. Because, or uh, I assume the book's critique of gender roles, because it... It takes the thing that we're supposed to, like, the character is supposed to be, we're supposed to go, oh, good for her. She's a self-possessed, powerful, independent woman. But then the thing she does is terrible. Yeah. So, like, we're like, well, maybe she shouldn't do that. Maybe she shouldn't because she did ruin those, that guy's life. Kind, Well, kind of. I mean, whatever. It's, they had their own issues. But, like... <laughs> I just, I was like, why would you change it or make her so, because I thought that was the thing. I was like, so she's just a terrible person. She seemed like just not a good person in yeah. the beginning of the movie, but then she doesn't become a better person. Mm-mm. She just, I don't know. We're way off on, yeah, on my, with that in the book. Mm. I got one more. Was Mike a robot? Um, I, I, none of that happens. Okay, cool. So the end of the movie, like you said, none yeah. of that happens. So, well, okay, let's. Well, we'll talk about that. Where should we talk about the end of the movie? <laughs> I'll let you decide where we should talk about the end of this movie. Let's talk about it in general discussion. Okay. I think might be the best thing to do. Okay. I guess we can move on to Lost in Adaptation, but I don't... <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to help I don't yet. think any of these are going to be in there, but let's do it and we can just give it a surf... We can just blush right through and be like, yep, nope, don't know, don't know, don't know, cool, all right. <laughs> Lost in adaptation. Just show me the way to get out of here, and I'll be on my way. Wow. Was it lost? Yes. Yes, and I want to get unlost as soon as possible. Katie, so they both, we talked about this a little bit. They both leave their jobs. Nicole Kim and, and, and Matthew Broderick both leave their jobs. They both quit, and they move into a mansion. We talked about how the fuck is this possible. Do we know? Well, no, because no, she works. They, yeah, they're just normal people. They're normal people with normal and jobs. Book, he's got, like, a normal... <sighs> nine to five kind of a job and she's she's for the most part she's a homemaker like she does the photography thing yeah she's she's pretty much a homemaker oh god why did they change it so much i don't know (laughs) okay why does bet midler's care who is in the book we've established through guess who that uh bobby the writer is she a writer (laughs) she's just bobby okay so bobby in the movie bet midler's character is a writer a famous writer who's and she should. Uh, this is the thing where when she when when Nicole Kidman runs into her, I'm like, why is she here? Why is her and her husband here? Yeah. And, and I I wrote this down and lost an adaptation at that point of like, why the fuck? Because she doesn't fit in remotely. Like she's like a Jewish writer from yeah. Brooklyn. Like she doesn't remotely fit into this weird waspy neighborhood. Uh, and she like does you know she just wears like normal clothes like she it, anyway so I was like why the fuck is she here and then later that is answered in the movie because I feel like they were like we should just mention it but it's not answered because she just goes 
uh, court ordered. I'm, we're here because it was court ordered. What? It's, it's a long story, is what she said. And I'm like, what? No, what? no it's what? a fake story. What, what court There's order no such... orders you to go live in a gated neighborhood? That in zero percent chance any court order. That makes no sense, and it's such lazy writing because they're just like, yeah, it's court ordered. And I'm like, and, and, and but then they play it off by like, eh, and then she's like, it's a long story. Don't, I uh, can't get into it. I'm like, no, but it doesn't make any yeah, sense. I, that why, what? Yeah. And it makes no sense because she wouldn't ever move here. No. Her, they wouldn't ever move there because it's this weird, super expensive gated community. And she's like a city, like writer. Okay. So in the book, it's Stepford, it's not like a gated community. Like okay. it, it's a nicer, it's a nicer community. community. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's in Connecticut, right? But it's not like, like the houses aren't giant mansions. See, and... that's the thing that makes more sense to me too. If it's a fu- if it, because it, what I imagined when I heard Stepford Wives, I didn't imagine everybody living in giant mansions yeah. on huge estates. I was expecting, basically, uh, the cookie cutter. Yes. Like seven sixties yes. and fifties and sixties uh suburbs where every house is the same but a different color and you know what I mean? Right. Where they slapped the same and they're and they're like n- nice enough houses, but they're like, you know, like a four or five bedroom house, you know, with a nice yard and like you know, like like nice uh, suburban houses, but like, you know, your neighbor is right next right. to you. And, and that's, not I like mean, that's the three acres away <laughs> that we get from the movie because she can watch her neighbor doing housework into the wee hours of the morning in the book, which so is one of the sense. weird things. And uh, I mean, like I said, you get the idea that it's a nicer neighborhood. Right. There is one um, one woman whose house she goes to and they have like a tennis court. Yeah, sure. But yeah. it's not like, oh, everybody lives on a giant plot of land in a huge mansion. Yeah, they literally and- are in like castles like yeah. these things are ridiculous and it and it's and it yeah it kind of i was like well because one it doesn't make sense how our people are living there how do they afford it how they they don't they neither of them are working anymore they couldn't have saved that much money from their jobs as tv executives Ugh, whatever and then was and then it's like why did Be- why did fucking bobby's character when they make her a writer who's like a super successful writer i'm like why would she ever move yeah to the city no, now if she's just another character in the yeah, book yeah she's just like sure. another ordinary she's a little kooky right but she's just another ordinary citizen and here's the thing everybody li- moved to the suburbs or like lots of people live in the suburbs not lot lots of people don't live in giant mansions and so you can have it wouldn't it wouldn't be strange to me if even if they wanted to make her a writer for Bette Midler's character, it would make more sense for her to be living in like a sort of generic up middle class upper yeah. class suburb than in fucking mansions in the middle of connect. Yeah. Like it just every change they made from the book, from what you've said, it just is astonishing. Like I'm like, why would you? Well, I think okay, so I think part of it is the time period because the book came out in the 70s yeah right so part of what he's satirizing i mean ira levin the author yeah um and it is a send-up of kind of gender roles and like um because this is against the backdrop of like women's liberation movement and second wave feminism and all that um so it's it's a send-up of that but it's also kind of a send-up of like the way that people move out to suburbia and then they become boring right yeah yeah, um, that's and that's the vibe I got. Uh, yeah. The thought, you know. So I, I think maybe what the movie was trying to do was trying to satirize like McMansion culture, yeah. which was a thing yeah, in the early two thousands. In the early two thousands, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, because you're right. Because it wasn't, it wasn't nearly. Uh, everybody already lived in suburbs. Yeah. At, in two thousand four, like everybody, you know, a lot of people already lived in suburbs. That was like that was a big movement in this, you know, yes. in the fifties and sixties and seventies where everybody getting home from wars and that sort of thing. They're building these huge cookie cutter suburbs that mm-hmm. everybody moved into that you you know you, what you imagine when you when you picture like, every house is the same. Blah, blah, blah. And that wasn't as much of a thing in the 2000s. So I could see or that wasn't something that needed to be sent up or satire or satirized anymore. Yeah. So I get to some extent why they would change it, but that it just makes no sense to me. Like it just, Right, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I think they tried to send up too many things yes. without ever succeeding at any of it. Like I said, they're just, just like, oh, let's let's make her a reality TV show producer so we can send up reality TV in the beginning of the movie. But all that does is ruin her character to some extent, yeah. in my opinion. Ruins 
our attack it makes us not care about her as much as we should because she seems kind of awful yeah. in the beginning of the movie um so they're like ah okay we got we got reality tv and then they're like oh let's also let's send up uh these, uh, these yeah mcmansions these, uh, these people moving in, who can barely afford it moving into giant mansions that are like all kind of just generic and boring and you know they're just giant let's satirize that but not really but there's no there's no there's no send up of it other than that's just where it takes place yeah. they don't ever really like have any interesting thing inter- they don't have anything interesting to say about it and then the whole gender roles thing that yeah i mean just, just pick a lane <laughs> and stay in it and it's the step for wise the lane you should probably pick is gender roles yeah. and and that sort of thing i don't know i i just felt like the movie didn't didn't have any fucking teeth like it just no. It never actually went after anything and in no, any interesting way. No, it didn't. Way. It it was pretending to have teeth, but it didn't have any teeth. Yeah, I was trying to like. And then they added the gay character, and they, there's some. The I think the most interesting it got was honestly there's a line where because uh, the main gay character, her main gay friend in the movie, Roger, mm-hmm. uh, he's very flamboyant. Yeah, and sort of uh, stereotypically. Uh, very much effeminate. so, especially for the time like, he was a right. two thousand very much a two thousand four gay, gay character. Gay character, and they do actually take a hit at that to some extent. There is a line about it that I yeah. thought was at least somewhat interesting, but it's more played as a joke and not. I'm not even sure if that was serious, but he eventually uh, the, the Roger, the gay character, is turned into a Stepford husband. Yeah, uh, and he's like becomes very masculine and and you know. Loses all of his uh, effeminate, mm-hmm. his speech and his the way he dresses and all that stuff. He gets sort of just sort of turned into a normal generic. I say normal, a generic. Yeah, she's just kind of a generic guy. Guy. Yeah, and she has a line. Nicole Kidman or somebody has a line about how it's not him mm-hmm. because he's not as flamboyant or as gay or he's not as effeminate. As she he says was. he's witty. He was witty, doesn't she? She says something, but but. Uh, what's his name? I believe it's Matthew Broderick says, don't, not all gay people have to be effeminate. Don't put them in a, like, basically yeah. like, you know, it's not fair of you to say, but, but he's also wrong. Cause he's just, it's weird because Matthew Broderick's wrong. He's like ignoring the fact that the character, the guy, the guy, the Roger was super effeminate and yeah. super like, that is who his character was. It almost is like. Because I was like, yeah, yeah, you tell him, Matthew Broderick. But then I'm like, wait, no. That's who the character was. But then the movie is almost like criticizing... Oh, boy. I'm going to have a stroke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the movie is criticizing the idea that gay people need to be effeminate or, or whatever. It, it has a line about like, yeah, you don't put all gay people in the same box. They're not all the same. You know, they're not... But then it makes their gay character that caricature right. of gay people. And then it's like, hey, but they don't have to be like that, except our gay character is like that. But then the character saying that not all gay characters have to be like that is wrong about the character he's saying it about because that character is like that. Right. Well, not just that he's wrong, he's fucking lying. Yeah. And being super shady because he knows what happened. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It. Let's just, let's let's move on to what your next okay. thing on here is. Boy, oh boy. All right. Um, when Nicole Kidman's character finally figures out to some extent what's going on, it's very random and just mm-hmm. sort of happens. So she's one night, she's like up late or she gets up after her and she says she's going to leave. She's like, we should leave. This is all messed up because th- at this point, Bette Midler's character has already been right. turned into a Stepford wife. And so she's like, this shit's fucked up. We're getting the kids and we're leaving. And he's like, fine, all right, we'll leave tomorrow. And then she, like, goes and do- is doing something, and she finds... The dog brings it to her. Oh, that's right. The robot dog brings her a remote. Then we've seen these remotes throughout the... Basically, just remote controls for the women. Yeah. And this one has her name on it. Yeah. And she's like, what? But it, But she doesn't know what it is. It just has her name on it. Because she's never... She's seen one, but she didn't know what they do. They've never right. They didn't actually like the we the audience saw, saw what it did, but yeah, she didn't. She doesn't. She could have. She, she. I mean, when I looked at it, I was like, "Oh, your husband bought you." Like for her, her character could have been like, "Did he buy me a monogrammed TV remote?" Like, because <laughs> because she wouldn't know what the fuck it was. There's yeah. no reason for her to think it's anything. But then so she's like, and then for no reason, 
just all of a sudden she's like, I'm going to look up all the other women around here. Yeah. On her computer. She starts Googling them and finding out that they're all successful business people. And I'm like, why did the remote make you think to go look up the other women in the neighborhood? And then when you find out they were used to be successful business people, you then assume that now they're that they live here, that they're something happened to them. It's so strange. I don't understand what. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with this one. <laughs> So and then and then fuck during that same scene she realizes she oh, why does she how does she stumble across an article about a stolen dog Yeah and then the robot dog looks sad Yeah so the like, implication what? is that they stole a prize winning terrier or whatever and, and then turned it and made a bunch of robot dogs based on that terrier but how would she have come across that article out of nowhere it just shows up yeah, on her computer. She just has it suddenly. She just clicks on a thing and it's like, whoop, Terrier, prize winning Terrier was missing a year ago. And you're, I'm like, how did that article, why is she, what? And then what, it's just so you can, that's where we, the dog came from? I don't even know what my question is. And this is going to be incomprehensible to anybody who hasn't watched <laughs> this movie. I'm so sorry. I don't. <laughs> Uh. This movie was nonsense. So she does kind of figure it out okay, in the so book. Okay, that's my question. How does she yeah, figure it out she, Well, in the book? There's a lot of little things that kind of add up to it, and it plays out pretty slowly. Um, kind of like when it's just starting to rain, right? right and yeah, the drops yeah, yeah, are slowly yeah, yeah, falling, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. suddenly it's pouring. Yeah. So I, I guess the, the equivalent to the scene of her looking everything up on the computer um, there's a scene where she goes to the town library and she goes back through newspapers yeah. for the town um, and finds the announcements about like um, when the men's association was formed and like there used to be a women's association, but it was shut down due to lack of interest because we hear all these women kept quitting. Yeah. Um, and she kind of finds out what some of these women used to do. Um, she's able to look and see like when particular people came to live in Stepford. So she's able to put together like kind of a timeline. Yeah. Which I think is what they were going for yeah. with the scene in the movie where she's Googling stuff. But it it's it's so poorly executed that we literally see her look up like two names, yeah. realize that the names of these women used to they also they were like successful business owners. And then it's like so they're robots. So what I don't like I don't even know what she she's just like so bad things are happening here. Yeah. And then she's like, We should leave. So this is this is the this this this. We mentioned it earlier. This makes no sense in the movie. In the little educational video that we discussed, they say they take the women, they put them in them in the in the easy bake oven, mm -hmm. and then the they slice them open and they put microchips in their brain, mm -hmm. and then do a couple of the little things, and then that is what makes them you know. I mean, essentially, the idea is that the like, it's like a parallel to like giving them basically like a lobotomy yeah. type of thing, and like cutting out, you know, the the, the free thinking and the mm -hmm. self possession sort of part of their brain, and just getting rid of it. So they say that, but then there's robots' bodies. They have they make a second body because we see Nicole Kidman yes look at a version of herself that is empty yes. Like, because its eyes open and there's nothing in it, but it's like her robot body. So then I'm like, wait, so do they put their brains in a different body? But that's not what they said in the video. They just mm -mm. said they added they, stuff right. to their brain. Yes. But then, so what are these robot bodies? Ah. But then here's the other thing at the end of the movie. So, so they have the, so, so initially they tell us they add microchips and they turn them into, they basically just like put a chip in your brain that makes you, makes them controllable. Then they're like, then they show us these fucking robot bodies and they're like, whoop, uh, we can make a robot of, the, it's like a second version of them that maybe we put their brain into or something. Yeah. But then at the end of the movie, when Matthew Broderick is in the basement hacking all the computers and freeing everybody, it switches all of the women. 
like the chips right, in their the, brain off. Yeah. And they're just themselves again. So what was the robot? They're not robots. They're themselves. But maybe they are robots because Mike's a robot. Christopher Walken's character ends up being yeah. a robot. And he's like totally a robot. And he's completely yeah. a robot because. We see his like wires. And yeah, because Glenn Close created him as a, a android. So. But he was completely created. Like he's a fake person. Yes. Because she created her own perfect spouse. It, they go back and forth. I was so confused of like, wh- wait, are they robots? Are they are they people with chips in their head? Because the movie cannot keep it straight Mm-mm. for the life of itself. Mm-mm. It does not know which they are. It's like they're robots now. They're people with chips now. They're well, they're kind of maybe they're robots. Maybe some of them are robots. Uh, maybe they're not robots. But they also yeah, because then the, the one earlier, the girl, the girl. She had to be a robot. The one at the square dancing thing. Yeah, she like short, she short circuits and like sparks fly out and they like, like she twists her head back on straight to fix her. But that's not what. Oh god. <laughs> I cannot help with this. Okay. In the book, the implication is that they literally murder their wives and then they have like robot replacements. Robot replacements. Okay, that's, yeah, I could be on board with that. Like, I mean, it's a story element, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but yeah, that's because, and I feel like the movie, for a while, that was what they were, that was going to be. But then they were like, well, nope, just put chips in their brain. And then it forgot what they said they were going to do. And then they were like, oh, right, now robots. And then they were like, oh, wait, no, ch- just chips in their brain so that we can reverse it. That might be is might be as simple as that. It might be that they were going to be robots and it was basically going to be kill them off their robots. Mm-hmm. But then when they needed that ending where they all are fine again, that they were like, wait, we got to say we put chips in their brain and we mm-hmm. can just turn the chips off. Mm-hmm. And then they can all come back and be normal people again. I bet that's fucking it. You know what? That explains why they used the device of the instructional yes. video, too, because that was easy to insert. Oh, and there's that line! Oh, there's a line! So when they show the education, I thought it was the weirdest fucking line, but it makes total sense now, because it was an 80-yard line. So when they show that educational video, they show the educational video where you can put chips in their brain, blah, 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 blah. And then, oh, this is 100% what it is. Because then they show the video on the wall. And then the video ends. And then there's an 80-yard line of the person going, of somebody. I don't even remember what character it is going, oh, weird, it's just a painting again. Here is the clip from the movie. It's a painting again. You'll be able to hear the audio of Matthew Broderick saying, it's just a painting again in a very obvious ADR, which means it was replaced and added later, sort of way. I believe this whole scene with the painting shoot was a pickup shot from later. They clearly reshot this whole scene and added it in because all of the actors are looking at the painting, so they didn't just kind of fake it in. They actually shot this scene, but I believe they went back and shot it way later, and they didn't have a giant TV screen, so they're like, haha, we'll make it the painting, and that'll work. It's a painting again. Because oh it was when they first shot it, it was just a painting on the wall. And then they were like, shit, we need a way for him to explain that it's chips in their brains and that they're not robots. Uh we'll do a we'll film a, we'll film an educational video and we'll and we'll and we'll have it play on the wall. But it'll go where a painting was in the original scene because it's like super fancy sci-fi tech. You know, like they turn those painting into a TV screen, plays the educational video about the brain chips, and it goes away and somebody goes, wow, it's just a painting again. So that way for the rest of the time where we see it and it's just a painting, we're not like, 
what well, was a TV screen a minute ago. And then, so that way, at the end of the movie, when they do the thing where Matthew Broderick goes into the basement and fucking unplugs everybody like with, through super hacker skills that he has no reason to know or understand. He was just mashing he just, buttons. He goes in, he breaks into the, the, the lab and is literally like rolling his hand. I, I feel like this might have been Matthew Broderick being like, this is dumb. They were like, <laughs> they're like, you gotta, you gotta do some buttony things. And he's just like, literally like mashing his hand yeah. just like everywhere on the things. And then that turns off the chips in their brain so that they can all come back and be people again that's 100 percent what it was that had to be what happened there that's the because th- that would make sense why the continuity makes no sense and why they can't keep track of whether or not they're robots or they're we solved it brain chips oh my god we solved it and that one line is so great now because i heard that in the movie and i thought it was so fucking weird where there's somebody's like Oh, it's just a painting again. <laughs> it was because it was like a weird line out of like like a sitcom or yeah. something. It was and it was out of place. And it, oh my god, we cracked the code. <laughs> well, she, I, I want to watch the commentary or oh something. I want to watch an interview about yes. this to see what people like what happened because that should, totally would make sense. We should watch it. <laughs> that would totally make sense. Oh shit. Okay. All right. Uh, that's all I got for Lost Adaptation. <laughs> Let's. Well, we got uh, better in the book, better in the movie. Okay, so here's Which what one? I want to do. Okay. Um, usually we do better in the book first, I think. Yeah. Um, I want to do a little switcheroo. Okay. Because I just want to... There were three things in the movie that I appreciated in a vague kind of way. Okay. And then I want to talk about the book. Okay. All right. So we'll say betterish in the movie. Betterish. It was okay in the movie. <laughs> it was okay in the movie. My life has taught me one lesson, Hugo, and not the one I thought it would. Happy endings only happen in the movies. Um, I liked the opening credits. Yeah. That kind of. I mean, they were way too long. Wait, which that's that's not this movie. That's a sign of the time where they. I, I, I watch a lot of movies for uh, for my YouTube show where they have opening credits that mm-hmm. are just go on forever. And it's one of my favorite things about modern cinema is we've done away with opening credits. Right. To mo- for, for, you know, to some extent at least. Because, boy, our opening credits boring. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like sitting through three minutes of names at the beginning of a movie. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're kind of interesting. But I, I liked that they kind of set up this analog between, like, women and household appliances. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a bunch of pictures and video of it's like a yeah, like a nineteen sixties like like the infomercials yeah. and like the like those things where they're like the home of the future and it's like yeah. you know they pull like a the the table and chairs pull out of the wall and a robot kitchen yeah ro- yeah yeah and like those are like really fun quirky videos to watch anyways and so they kind of incorporate those yeah those so I, I thought that was interesting um, I enjoyed the dig at Connecticut. Yeah, that was a good line. At the end, Glenn, that was like the one really good line in the movie when Glenn Close, his character, is like, where could I do this and no one would notice? Where could I hide a bunch of robots? Connecticut! (laughs) Where could I hide a bunch of robots in a neighborhood or something like that? I was like, zing, got (laughs) them. Yeah, that that was funny. Yeah. Um, And I I also, I appreciated, and I know they did this on purpose, but I appreciated that they cast the most boring, bland, soggy oatmeal men that they could possibly find as the husbands of Stepford. Just fucking mediocre white men who truly believe that they deserve a woman who is so hot and so perfect (laughs) that she's literally not real. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I, I have the note. I was like, you know, Matthew Roderick's kind of perfect casting for the eternally unimpressive and impotent man. <laughs> <laughs> Zing, got him. <laughs> I mean, it is though. And then like, old like, Matthew Roderick is just sad. Like a couple times in the movie, they're like, "Oh, but he's so handsome," and I'm like. Well, they're faking it, though. Like those. Th- but Nicole Kidman says that to him at Does one she? point. Yeah, oh. she says he's handsome. Well, Maybe she was just trying to get him to not turn her into a robot. I think that's probably what it was. But, <laughs> like, he kind of looks like a bowl of cold oatmeal. I yeah. Yeah. Yes, he does. He looks like old Matthew Broderick. He's not. Yeah. It's not good. He didn't. Just things didn't go well. Milk toast. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So those were the things that I okay. thought were okay about the movie. Better in the book. You like to read? Oh, yes. I love to read. 
What do you like to read? Everything. Uh, okay, so first of all, everything. Cool. Sounds um, like it. But I, I kind of, I want to talk about the quote-unquote twist that the movie does at the end. Where it's actually Glenn it's actually Close's Glenn Close. So let's character. set that up for the audience a little okay, bit. Okay, set that up. Because okay, um, so uh, this is what I imagine is all the manufactured ending that was rewritten and reshot because audiences didn't like the sort of more true-to-the-book ending where Nicole Kidman, where Matthew Broderick does basically just kill his wife and turn her into yeah. a robot, and then she's a robot, and then the movie ends. Uh, so what happens is, we think that happens, but then uh, they're at a party... Like a little, uh, you know, a few days later or something mm-hmm. like that. They're at a big like party, and um, boy, a lot of things happen at this party. But uh, Nicole Kidman goes and distracts Mike, who's the head, uh, who's uh, Christopher Walken's character, distracts him in the garden, is like hitting on him. And then while this is going on, Matthew Broderick sneaks away to the basement to the lab, and like we said, rolls his face on all the keyboards <laughs> and somehow turns everything off. Uh, it's so it's yeah. so so slipshot all, all done. the women pop back to being themselves. yes yeah, they literally zap zoip themselves back you know are are now themselves again and then uh, there's a confrontation between Christopher Walken and Matthew Broderick and then he's gonna like kill Matthew Broderick or he's gonna like yeah something's yeah. gonna happen he's gonna he's like goes to get a candlestick to like club Matthew Broderick and then Nicole Kidman grabs a candlestick or something and hits. Christopher Walken's character in the head, knocking his head off, exposing that he was a robot the whole time. Yes. And then Glenn Close, who is his wife, who we assumed was a robot this yes. whole movie, uh, is actually a real person. And she was the one who started all of this. She created Mike. Right. Because she was the world's foremost scientist. She was, as she exclaims to the crowd, I was the world's foremost genetic, si- whatever, fucking, it's, this was all <laughs> clearly so clearly reshot and just last minute, right? It's all terrible. Um, but she actually yeah, claims she was a scientist in it, but she never was satisfied or blah, blah, blah. And, or she, she didn't have a good spouse. And so she created a robot spouse, Mike, Christopher Walken's character. And then she created a whole city where the... People could turn their wives into robots. She just wanted a very idyllic fifties. Yes, like she she keeps going on about sort of like the uh, the simplicity and the idealism of like that sort of the traditional gender stereotypes right. and the stay at home wife. The the she talks about like quality time and yeah all that kind of nonsense yeah. yeah and so and then so she they were turning all the women and she goes well, and they ask her well why just women and she goes well it was going to be the men too eventually so i guess her yeah. idea was that eventually eventually she, everyone would just be like a chip person yeah i guess so like she was just going to turn everybody into robots to be this kind of perfect yeah. neighborhood I, just, or like, whatever she was just going to live in a robot world i guess i guess the thing yeah and then she but she, she's still so in love with Christopher Walken, even though his head's off, she kisses it and gets electrocuted and dies. Yeah. That's what happens. It's so weird. And it's so sudden and doesn't make any sense. So. So, yeah. The ending is, it it turns out it was all a woman. Right. It was all her character. Yeah. Um, And I, I think that we are correct that they added that last minute and it was originally supposed to end more like the book. I think so, yeah. But I just want to go ahead and talk about how that choice undermined the whole fucking point. Yeah. (laughs) Because the whole idea of the Stepford Wives is that we have this group of men who want so badly to be the king of the castle. Yeah. That they are willing to literally murder yeah. their spouses in order to achieve that. And when we take that away and we put it in this context of oh now we have a woman who just wants to live life like it's the 1960s and that's why she did all of this. What's the what kind of point are we trying to make? It like what's the it. goddamn point? 
I I think you can. I would argue you can still get a similar point because it doesn't take away the fact that all the men still did those things and still felt that way. They're that you know they weren't robots. They were still. You know what I mean. But not Matthew Broderick's character. Oh well, that's a whole other fucking bag of worms. Is how like Matthew Broderick's character who decides not to kill her, and then Nicole Kidman's all like. He's a good guy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah he only qu- contemplated murdering yeah, you right? and turning you into a submissive robot. He only he thought only about it for a while. He only seriously thought about it. He only seriously considered it for like a long time. For like the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he, in the last minute, he was like, you know what? I won't kill you. And she's like, yay. And I'm like, fuck Such you. Such a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> Like, fuck Just a shining you. example of masculine excellence. Uh, and she even says that. But like, <laughs> he's a I, real man. I was like, oh Jesus. Yeah, real men only think about murdering their wives. Yeah. <laughs> they don't actually go through with it. But in the book, he does. Yeah, and in the he movie, totally, he did too. He totally does it. Yeah. And like the idea that you get because when she's looking up, um, and like I said, like Stepford is it's more normal. Yeah. In the in the book. Um, and the the women, at least the ones that we really get to know, are you know they're they're just people. Yeah. Um, but she does when she's kind of doing her research in the library, she comes across like some of the women in the neighborhood. They were academics, you know. They were this. They were that. They were really intelligent. Yeah. So kind of like one of the ideas of this is that these men are so fundamentally selfish. Yeah. That they would rather take away everything yeah. that these women have to give to the world yeah. in order to have a live-in maid. Yeah. yeah. The movie does that. The movie does that. Yeah, they do in it. In the original they do it, cut. No, no. They do it shittily and weakly. Well, yeah, they do. But they, I mean, even if you just, if you get rid of the new ending that they made on this thing. Yeah. Because that's the thing, is that it... it, it, it the message is still there because they still do that scene where and she's Nicole Kidman confronts him and is like, are you that fucking impotent? And like, you know, he's like, oh, I, you were always so smart and so brilliant and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, and that and that's that whole scene is about that. And that would basically be the climax of the film. That would be the moment that stuck with you as an audience. Yeah. And that would drive the point home. That would that would have been the because then the, the only other thing that happens after that is she walks out and is a Stepford wife. And we're like, oh, shit. And so we're stuck with that final moment where it is about these shitty men who couldn't fucking stand the fact that a woman was smarter than them or, 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 yeah. or as smart as them or, and were achieving things. And so that was what the movie would have succeeded at communicating. I say succeeded. They would have at least somewhat succeeded at communicating. But then because test audiences were like, oh, it's dark. And then why isn't it happy at the end? They had to add the other ending, and so you completely forget that that's completely all lost because we get get Glenn Close monologuing about the idyllic 1950s, knocking off Christopher Walken's head with a baseball bat, and then kissing it and getting electrocuted, and it's like, what just happened? (laughs) No, that's what I'm saying. Like, they fucking undermine the whole point. Yeah. Like, it's there, sure. Yeah. But it's weakened and oh, we've yeah, forgotten horribly. about yeah, it's it. Forgot- like, I think forgotten they, about it's the bigger they thing. They undermine it by tacking on that weird last 15 minutes. Yes. 100%. I, yeah. Because I, I, like I said, I, the point is still there. It's just you, we forget. I because just, just A plot twist is not always a good idea. <laughs> no. It's a terrible idea. And it just makes no sense. And yeah, like you said, it makes you... Because it, it's such a more interesting moment and it's but again that's why audiences didn't like it because it made them feel uncomfortable and they were yeah. like oh fuck that's you know and so they were like shit well we gotta go ahead a happy ending where they all get their minds back and then they're all you know because it's not it's not challenging at all but that's that's what that's exactly what happened and again i still don't even think the original cut would have been very good necessarily Probably not but at least would have had preserved that ending yeah that would have been more poignant and and and, and more important so there's another thing in the book that I want to mention. Okay. Um, because I really enjoyed it. So um, you've been to Disney Disney World is the one in yeah, the Florida, one in Florida, right? Yeah. Have you been to the Hall of Presidents? I, I've seen it and I know of it. I haven't been to it. So in the book, the um, the main guy who is like the ringleader of the, this whole operation, his name is Dale. I guess he would be like Mike, Mike's character, kind of. sort of, except yeah. not a robot. Yeah, well, well. We'll just set all of that aside. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
the reason that he is the mastermind of this whole thing is that he worked making animatronics for Disney World in the Hall of Presidents. Awesome. And it was like, it was so funny to me because like the Hall of Presidents, it's creepy. Yeah. But it's not fooling anybody. No, no, not at all. (laughs) No, they're they're very <laughs> fine animatronics. They're very fine animatronics, but they're not passing. No, as they're people. not passing as people. That's a, <laughs> not even a little bit. And this one that people all the guys all work for, like yeah, NASA and Microsoft. Well, that's, and, yeah, that's a thing um, in the book as well. It's not just him working for Disney. They're yeah. also the other men have like um, high tech jobs yeah. like that. Um, different companies because it was a different time, but. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, not Microsoft. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but maybe NASA, <laughs> potentially. Uh, yeah, the Hall of Presidents. The thing I had, that I'd never been to the Hall of Presidents, but there used to be at the St. Louis Zoo, mm-hmm. which I grew up in St. Louis. There's, it, It's not there anymore, but in the living planet. The living world. Living world. In one of the rooms, they, they've completely changed the living world since I was a kid, but one of them, they had a, an animatronic uh, Charles Darwin do you remember that? I don't. They had an animatronic Charles Darwin that was like the Hall of Presidents. That was, he was mm-hmm. sitting in his office, and every five minutes he would stand up and and talk about finches and and beak evolution and stuff like that, and uh-huh. be like, oh, no, and then he would sit back down. And it's that that was the closest thing to the Hall of Presidents. <laughs> <laughs> it was just Charles Darwin, which is arguably cooler than most of the U.S. presidents. So. <laughs> All right, uh, are we on to uh, just talking a little bit more generic discussion, and then or yeah. is there more about the book? Yeah, no, that we can go on to more generic discussion. I because I, I just men, I if you are so goddamn insecure yeah. about your wife being better than you, why didn't you marry an untalented, <laughs> uneducated woman? Like that's the answer to your problem. Yeah, marry someone who's worse than you. Yeah. Or more importantly, how did they how did they marry these impressive <laughs> women? How did these impressive women decide to be with these schlubby idiots? That comes up in the book a couple times, Does it? and okay. it's pretty funny. Because <laughs> she'll like look at the husbands, and they're like very unimpressive, and of course the wives are beautiful and busty yeah. and. Yeah. The other thing that I thought was interesting, so even after in that ending, I, this is I just I've been going through my notes. Even in that ending, so the tacked on ending where they're not robots, they're brain chipped people who get mm-hmm. reversed. After they get reversed, one of them grabs one of the remotes and crushes it with her bare hands. And I'm like, wait, so are they robots? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> So I don't confused. know. I don't know. And, and, and one other thing, a small thing that yeah. I think kind of undermines a lot of what we've talked about is the book club that the women have in okay. the movie. Um, because one of the big things in the book is that they don't socialize with each other. Oh, okay. They like say hi to each other at the grocery store right. and that's it. Because the idea is that they don't have their own lives. Yeah, they're they robots. They don't have they their don't... own interests. Yeah. They just exist yeah. to serve their husband and their family. Which would make sense if they're like f- f- literally like robots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure then how that scene like fits into the scheme of things. I think that was added purely for comedic Ugh, effect God, because it wasn't funny it wasn't but there's because there's there there's there's a several it's got some of the most jokes per minute in the movie yeah where there's the i mean it's literally nothing but jokes in that scene which makes me think that it might have been added later when they're like we need some more jokes because like <laughs> literally all it is is they show up at the at the at the at the book club nicole kidman character goes oh i really enjoyed this book i read recently some actual book and they're like that's nice we're going to be talking about this Christmas ornament book or whatever the fuck yeah. it is. And like, and so it's like a big laugh line of like, they're re- you know, cause they're so dumb that they're reading a yeah. a book about Christmas decorations or whatever. And, and not even so dumb necessarily, but all they're, they're only consumed with like right. home and keeping and that sort and of thing. And more, more like it's supposed to be a send up of like, 
like I want to say Pinterest culture, but Pinterest wasn't <laughs> a thing. <laughs> Uh, but like suburban housewife, yeah, like, like suburban housewife. So that's not really a critique of gender roles. No, no, it's more of a critique. Yeah, it's more of a ha ha ha. Women are so dumb, and they have dumb interests. I see. I don't think that's what it is, though. I I think what they were going for was not that. I, I was that. I mean, I, you can definitely read it that way. Um, I think that wasn't the goal. My guess would be that the scene was more about. Because they've been turned into mindless. Right, but then you're just critiquing people who actually find that interesting. To be fair, there I think that could be a critique of the Stepford Wives in general. Or, or of the... And I, I want to tread lightly. Not tread lightly, but I want to just make sure I say this in the way that... Express this in a way that makes sense. It, it is our... And it's similar to what you said, where then you're not making fun of... That you're making fun of people who like decorating yeah. and that sort of thing. I think you could say the same thing about the movie as a whole to some extent, or not as a whole. That there is when you when you go after gender roles in this way, and you're and you're and you're sending up the stay at home housewife, you are implicitly critiquing and attacking to some extent women that do f- are in right. that role. Okay, I think I see. What you you're see saying. what I'm saying? Yeah. That, that and, uh, stay at home moms right. are, are and that sort of thing, or stay at home wives and housekeepers are sort of. And the idea of having of, of seeing value in that is kind of a third wave feminism yeah, thing, that's what I'm, which is trying to get at. Yeah, it's more recent, so I think you're right. I don't. I think we couldn't necessarily have critiqued that in that way back in 2004. No, not as much. No. Not as much as we can now. Yeah. Now that we've had a lot of other conversations. Yeah, and especially not in 1970. Right, but that element isn't present in the book. Well, I just mean in general the idea of. Yeah, right. I, I guess I get what you're saying. I'm saying just more broadly, when when your representation of a mindless, uninteresting person is a stay-at-home mm-hmm. wife, a, a homemaker, mm-hmm. when that's what you're using as your critique of gender roles, which is a fair thing to do and makes a lot of sense, Yeah, you are, to some extent, firing, shooting at, or critiquing people who do that. That's true. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And again, I think that's uh, that's who people who choose to do that, and that's what they want to do. Uh, obviously, that's not the intent of the book. Like, the intent is much more focused on critiquing very specific and outdated gender roles, and the idea, yes. and, and and the and critiquing the unimpressive men who feel the need to be lord and commander of their fucking home and and hold women back from fulfilling careers and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. which is. A very worthwhile thing to critique and sounds like it was done very well i guess my only point and i only thought of it because of what you said about the whole decorating thing and and sort of laughing at the expense of people that find that at the expense of people who find that interesting yeah i think you could say the same thing in general about yeah homemakers that's fair stay-at-home wives yeah. when you're ha look how it, like this is so dumb why why would any woman choose to do this they have to literally be turned into a robot to choose mm-hmm. to be a stay-at-home wife. The stay-at-home wives are, are somewhat in the crosshairs of that, or for lack of a better word, I keep saying stay-at-home wife. I don't know whether, you know, women who are homemakers or stay-at-home who yeah. work, who, you know, they're also, they're in the crossfires of your critique. So that's just something to consider or to think about. And again, I, I think it's, yeah, fine. I mean, that's, that's going to happen right. when well, you do any sort yeah. of satire. Well, and, <sighs> Like anything else we could discuss in regards to gender roles, in regards to misogyny, it hinges on choice. Yeah, yes. If you choose to be a stay-at-home wife, to be a homemaker, to be a stay-at-home mom, if that's what you find value in, girl, get it. Yeah. If not, you should have the choice to do something else. Yeah. And I feel like that's pretty simple. It is. It is very simple. And I I don't understand why people don't understand it. I don't either. Yep, that's going to do it. All right. All right. In that case, wow, that was a wide-ranging, meandering, sometimes incomprehensible discussion. Let's get to the final verdict. Now, uh, are you ready for your sentence? Sentence? But there must be a verdict first. Sentence first. Verdict afterwards. Katie, what are you thinking? 
I'm thinking I'm going to give it to the book. <laughs> uh, yep. The book was really good. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and it's really short. It's more like a novella. Yeah, it is. Um, it's, it, it's like under 150 pages. So you could you could put it away in no time at all. Yeah. Um, but I, I recommend it. It was a good read. Mm-hmm. The movie was utter nonsense. Terrible. My last note that I have when we were watching that last 15 minutes just says, what is this weird last second twist? This is nonsense. What the actual fuck is happening? Yeah. Which it is. Yeah. It was because it was it was a last minute nonsense. twist and last minute twist in every sense of the word in that it was the last minute of the movie and also last minute of production where yeah. like, probably after production had ended and they went back and added a whole another ten minute ending that was just completely bonkers and made no sense. So the book, the, the book's book better. It. Read the Stepford Wives. You can probably read it in about as much time as it would take you to watch the movie. Maybe not quite that fast, but <laughs> not too much longer. All right. Chalk one up for the books. Katie, what is our next book slash movie? Um, coming up, we will be doing The Martian. Yeah. You're going to have time to read it, right? Yeah. Okay. Switch episode. Yeah, we're going to do a switch episode um, because you've already read The Martian. I read The Martian before the movie came out. Like yeah. six six months to a year before the movie came out. I, I read it like right after the book came out. Yeah. I heard I uh, haven't read it at all. It. So I heard Adam Savage talking about it on his podcast from Mythbusters. He was a big fan of it, and he's actually had uh, yeah, it's Andy, Andy Weir. He's had him on his podcast a couple times to talk about the book and that sort of thing. So yes, The Martian, the movie. Uh, most people have probably seen it. It was pretty huge. Yeah, directed by Ridley Scott, came out in like twenty sixteen. Starring Matt Damon. Matt Damon, main character. It's great. Well, spoilers. The movie's good. I also like the book. We'll see which one I prefer <laughs> on that episode. In the meantime, on the next prequel episode, we'll probably talk about Deadpool 2 because we saw that. And uh, we'll have to figure out what we want to talk about in The Martian. For learning things with this film is lit. I don't know. Something to do with sci-fi. Or something. something. We'll f- I'll come up with something. Oh, shit. I have to come up with it. Yeah, Damn. you do. Fine. <laughs> Until then, guys, gals, I'm Byron, and everybody else, keep reading books, keep watching movies, keep being awesome, and keep defying gender roles. Bye.